When you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, hello YouTube. Welcome back to the Grease Goblin Junior channel. Today's video is going to be something similar to the Battle of Ice video I did for Stannis. This video is going to be covering the Battle of Marine or the Battle of Fire. We know a little bit of information because of the sample chapters, and it's much easier, I think, to maybe predict this battle than what's going on with Stannis, because with Stannis, the battle hasn't really started yet. We're basically going off of the foreshadowing. Now, what I will say about the Battle of Ice is I think it's logically to predict a lot of the things that happen in that battle, whereas the Battle of Fire, there is a couple of things that I think are really big players. And I'm going to talk about them as we get further into the video, and especially towards the end um, is where I'm really going to talk about the Dragonbinder Horn, which is I think is a major wild card that we really don't know what's going to happen with and it's a it's just it's to me it's the one thing that is stopping me from really saying i think i know what's going to happen in this battle and there's another thing that i think works into the politics of marine because again i don't think those are you know over now that we're getting into winds of winter and i think there could be a major twist that we could see because by all purposes and through Tyrion sample chapters um, with Barristans, with Victarion, it kind of seems like this battle is going really well for Danny's forces and going really bad for the Yunkish and the Slavers. So let's get into it and set the stage for the battle. But before we do, if you guys like to like, subscribe, and comment, please do. It helps the channel grow. Reach up here that might like this content as well. And let's get into it. So the battle is mainly taking two form the battle is basically on two fronts at the moment there's one basically at the waterfront in the bay next to marine and then there's also the battle right outside of the gates now we're going to take this in two parts so the first part of the video is going to be talking about the battle underneath marine and right outside of the gates so this battle is currently being led by Barristan with the really all of Danny's forces that she has at this moment. Again, Danny is not here. She's, you know, getting captured by the Dothraki. So Barristan is in charge. Now, Barristan at this moment his main objective is to take out the big trebuchets at hitting Marine. And he's going to do this by pretty much trying to quickly strike at the Yunkish and or the Giscari legions, because that's who gets sent to meet Barristan and to protect the trebuchet. With that being said, Barristan is hoping to create enough of a distraction, enough of a, I guess, of just hell on these forces that that'll allow all of the Unsullied to get outside of the gates. Because what the really big point of this battle that can really tip it is if the Unsullied get stopped from getting outside of the gates, because there's about 5,000 Unsullied sitting basically behind the gate, and when this battle comes out, you want to get all of your Unsullied out, because that's the biggest thing. The Unsullied are very disciplined. They're a great fighting force when united. If you have it to where the Unsullied are not fully out and they're kind of forced into this this gate and they all can't get out well then you're gonna have a massive issue because then you're gonna have an advantage from the other side the Giscari who have more men than the Unsullied the Giscari legions are about 6,000 Barrison even notes that we are outnumbered in this battle so we are gonna have to win by good tactics and we are gonna have to win with the merits of our soldiers compared to them which the Unsullied are inherently better now, the way this battle starts to shape up, we hear a little bit about it through Tyrion, and we also hear a little bit about it through Barristan. So, currently, we're told that Barristan's plan is going pretty well. He basically rides out on Danny's Silver, her horse that she got from Drogo back in the first book, and he kind of does this attack where he's going straight towards the Trebuchet and the 6,000 Giscari, and at the last second, he kind of turns and go for, goes for a weaker legion. He goes toward a unit of herons. And for all accounts, it would appear that they are slaughtering them. Now, this is something that's also key that Barristan notes in the sample chapter, is that if we look at the way the battle is going right now, so if we look at the way the sun is coming up, the sun is distinctively in the enemy's eyes. So the Yunkish, the Slavers, the Giscari 
It's in their eyes. So they're basically looking into the sun as Barrison's forces are coming on. That isn't a distinct advantage because, again, you're going to be blinded. So, again, we're told that the battle is going pretty well. And then we also know on this front that eventually it gets to the point where the Unsullied are completely outside of the gate. And eventually the two forces, the Giscari and the Unsullied, are in full battle. That's what we learn from Tyrion's chapter. And by all accounts, Barrison notes that the battle is going really, really well. Everything that Barrison wanted to happen is happening. So another part of Barrison's plan that we see is that the Windblown, who they were supposed to switch sides, went through with that promise. They switched sides, and they've even slain the commander Gorzak, who on Tyrion's camp had been giving them orders until they get new orders. So again, by all accounts, the battle is going well on Barristan's front. And we now kind of go to the Second Sons, who are the next betrayal that the, the Yunkish will face in the Slavers. The Second Sons at first were told to hold the beaches against the Ironborn, because when Barristan's doing this attack, he also hears and sees that there are Kraken banners, that the Greyjoys have entered. And we're going to talk about that front of the battle in a second. But for now, let's stick on to the main front, I would say. And we learn that the Second Sons, their second command, was to basically using their cavalry to flank the Unsullied in this fight. But at this point, the Second Sons have completely flipped sides. They're now for Danny. They're basically saying that, oh, yeah, this was a big plan basically to cover up you know, them switching sides and for them to get back into Danny's favor, saying that this was a big ploy to, you know, attack the Yunkish in the back and all of that. So presumably what I would predict here is that what the Second Sons were told to do, um, they're actually going to do the opposite. They're actually going to go behind the Giscari and flank them instead. So again, we see two different sellsword companies flip on the Yunkish and two of their better companies as well. And even without that, if the Second Sons were to just sit out of this battle, the battle is going very, very well for Danny and Barristan's forces. And to also build on to this fact, the reason, again, this battle is called the Battle of Fire is that the dragons have come as well. Now, there's some interesting points with the dragons because we don't see a Victarion POV during the actual battle yet. We see him before the battle, and that's something we're going to talk about here in a second. But... Again, for now, the dragons are wreaking havoc on the slavers' forces, and Rhaegal is still openly attacking, but it seems that Viserion seems to have withdrawn back to the pyramid, so we still see one of the dragons um, attacking. Now, the question is, I would assume that the dragons, the reason they come into battle is because of all of the blood, they sense food and all of that, and I think that makes a lot of sense. So that could be the reason that they attack. Now, when we flip to the other conflict, the second conflict, we learn that Victarion, again, this is his POV sample chapter, and this is going to be before the battle starts. Victarion is planning for Dragonbinder to be blown three times by Thralls. We also note that Victarion plans to catch the slavers back, disguising some of his ships as just common merchant or fishing galleys. And he will do this basically by having all of his men below the deck. And also, if we, you know, don't forget, in Dance, he does capture quite a few merchant ships. So this plan could work pretty well. And from what we hear from Tyrion and his POV, it sounds like the Greyjoys are, and the Ironborn specifically, are actually winning. Now, moving on. Again, like I talked about with Barristan's POV, Barristan sees that Victor Victorion and the Ironborn have arrived and appeared they easily outnumbered about the 20 ships that were there previously in the previous day. And Tyrion builds up upon this and says that the Ironborn are slaughtering the slaver ships and are landing hundreds of men every minute. Now he's told this by one of the messengers telling the Second Sons what to do in this battle. They don't listen to it because... Bet Brown Blant, Ben Plum was off somewhere else, so they didn't initially listen to these. And again, it's so bad. So again, we have to infer that it is so bad that the Second Sons, who are more of a cavalry division, are being told to help reinforce that front. And again, it shows kind of the Yunkish are not great at strategy. What are the Second Sons really supposed to do? They're a cavalry division. You should use them like that. 
And they are being told to basically stand on the beaches and wait for the Ironborn to come. Not a great plan, in my opinion. But again, if that is how desperate that front is, I would assume the Ironborn are destroying the slavers. The Ironborn are clearly better, um, especially at a naval. And also, they're just a great force that caught the Yunkish and the slavers off guard with the Victarion plot that he ends up doing. Now, this is where I think things get very interesting, because up to this point, I want to say that none of our characters have heard a horn, but there's something very interesting going on. We notice on one hand that Viserion goes back to the pyramid, but Rhaegal does not, and we haven't heard a horn being blown, but is this maybe some foreshadowing that Dragonbinder actually worked on Rhaegal, and that is why Rhaegal is continuing the attack, and maybe we'll see that in Victarion's next POV. But again, I can maybe make the claim here that actually there could be this idea that it's just the blood, um, and that Rhaegal is just attracted to it. Could be that as well. So again, for this battle, and again, sorry guys if I sound kind of weird, my nose is kind of stuffed up right now, but my overall conclusion from the battle is that it's going very poorly for the anti dany forces and slavers, Tyrion notes as much as their forces are being pinched from two sides. So the, the big idea here is that when the Greyjoys and the Ironborn win their fight on that co side of the battle, or say Barristan and their forces win the fight there, they're going to be getting pinched from two different sides, and that's always a recipe for disaster for the attacking force, or for the, for the one force anyway. Now, let's add to this that the dragons have also been joining the attack. This is a massive issue to the slavers. We know that the slavers have been kind of trying to build, like, basically ballistas type. And they don't really seem like they've been effective if they've even been getting shot. Um, we don't hear of them in any of the POVs of them taking shots at the dragons. But this is a massive issue for the slavers as a whole. And again, I talked about this already, but... When you have the Second Sons and the Windblown, who are very important to the, the Yunkish and the Slavers, switching sides, it, it's just kind of the dagger in, in them. And when you look at Barrison's front, they were too slow to act, right? The, the, what Tyrion notes and Barrison also notes is that as soon as this attack sh happens from Barrison, there should have been a counterattack. There should have been some cavalry attack or some force that kept the Unsullied from getting fully out of a gate. Because again, these are 5,000 guys. It is not something that's going to be done very quickly. Again, all of these soldiers are armored up. They have spears. They have swords. It's not exactly a quick movement, right? And I get it. The Unsullied are extremely disciplined. They're extremely ready for combat. Still, it takes a while. And... These forces were just way too late to respond. Barristan he basically catches them off guard. And that's kind of a common theme for this battle, is that one side has all of the military prowess, and the other side kind of has more of the numbers, but they don't use them right. And that's kind of the issue. And again, I talked about this, that the Giscari do outnumber the Unsullied, but the Unsullied are far more disciplined. And they have higher morale with the battle turning right now. We also see the idea that they are not really in the sun right now, right? The sun is with the Unsullied, blinding their opponents, adding just another element that is not good for the Giscari. And another thing I want to note here is that we have to remember that some of these forces are going to be chained together. That's some of the forces that we see Barristan taking out, that the slaves are actually chained together so that they can't retreat. And it makes them easy targets. Again... It just shows the disadvantages of one side. And I think I think Victorian and Barrison are probably going to win this battle very easily. I think everything's pointing to them winning, but that's where I think things get interesting. When all of these slaving forces have been taken out, and we see Victorian and Barrison's factions meet up, how is that going to go? Victorian is coming here thinking he's going to get Daenerys, he's going to get a dragon... Well, is Victorion going to steal a dragon with Dragonbinder? Or will a dragon go to Euron? What could happen there? And either way, Victorion is not going to want to take any commands from Barristan 
he is only going to want to meet Danny, which could create a lot of issues between the two factions. And I think something that I found on some people's theories, which I thought was very interesting, is that we've talked a lot about on this channel how Barristan is very much a reflection of Ned in book one when it comes to book five. And where I'm going with this is Barristan trusts a character that seems very suspicious, has his own motivations, and doesn't really seem trustworthy in the shave pate. And we're given a specific part of dialogue or thought process from Barristan that all of Danny's forces are outside the walls, except the shave pate's forces, who are basically on top of the walls with crossbows, and they are controlling the gate, more or less. And we're even told specifically from Barristan that if someone was to get, you know, if the Kaskari came too close to these walls, for instance, they would get mowed down because these walls are extremely good. And again, crossbow fire from the walls is going to be devastating to an army. So another thing we also see with Barristan when it comes to that is he constantly thinks about the shave paint and mistrusts him. And another part that we see is that Barristan, in his mind, thinks that they need to stay behind the walls. They give more of a strategic advantage, and everything is telling him he should do that, but he knows that he has to attack. Because of the Pale Mare. And would this be a time where Shave Pate flips? He keeps Barristan outside the walls, slaughters them, or at least tries to, basically staking his claim on Marine and even possibly killing his dart to cement his rule while Danny is gone. Is that something that could happen? I mean, again, nothing really ever seems to go perfectly in A Song of Ice and Fire, and there does seem like there's some very ambiguous things that George has set up, notably with Victarion and the Shave Pate. Could the two of them be involved in something that could shake up this entire battle? Because as of right now, the battle seems like it's going too well. So again, let me know what you guys think about the back little portions of stuff I talked about in this video, because I think they are very important um, and could really shake up this battle, because right now it's very straightforward in how things are going. And that's what I talked about with the Battle of Ice and with Stannis, I, I feel like I have a good idea of where it's going. There aren't as many wild cards in that battle, right? In this battle, it's very straightforward until you kind of get towards the end. Like, how is this going to shape Marine and the outcome of when Danny comes back? What will she find? Is she going to find Shave Pate in control of the city and she will have to basically take apart the city once again? How are the people of Marine going to be looking at Danny when they have the two dragons that are just still just roaming around doing whatever they want and you have this flu or disease that's basically running rampant through the city and Danny as a whole has been losing a lot of support. Um, so again, it's very interesting the way Danny coming back to Marine is going to be shaped by this battle and what are the circumstances for her coming back. So again, thank you guys all for watching. I really enjoyed doing this video. I'm thinking about doing the Battle of Storm's End or the Battle of Storm's End um, the next video next week. So let me know if you guys want to see me do that. If you want me to do some other type of video, let me know. And I will see you guys all in the next video. Bye, guys.